Good evening. It's Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, and this is the Bob Leonard Show. We'll be with you for about an hour. And like we tell you every week, we take the stories you've been watching on television, reading about in the newspaper over the last week or 10 days, and we put our spin on it. We, we try to give you the story behind the story. And like we tell you every week, it's only our opinion. Although when we give you factual information, we believe those facts to be true. Now, if you miss tonight's program on this regularly scheduled Tuesday night, this program is repeated on Comcast on Wednesday night from 11 to 12. And then it's also played on a continual basis on flinttalk.com. So if you have a computer and punch flinttalk.com in, the programs will come up, you push another button, and it'll play that program either this week's or it goes back about eight, ten weeks. Any program you may want to see again or you hadn't seen, you just push the button and it'll come up. You know, we tell you that when we come in here, we're going to be talking to you about stories that maybe you haven't heard the entire history of that story or the background or the facts. We have a couple stories like that this week we want to talk about. And the first one uh, that has caused a lot of consternation in the uh, public's mind, it concerned the uh, two students who were attending Southwestern High School that were in jail for a very serious crime of home invasion. And that had a maximum sentence of 20 years. These two youngsters were allowed to leave the jail and go play in a football game. Now, according to the journal investigative reporter Ron Fonger, who broke this story, after pleading guilty to the charge, these two new felons were allowed to be sentenced under the Holmes Youthful Trainee Act that by Judge uh, Jeffrey Nethercott, circuit judge, which allows them to have their felony record expunged after one year if they don't commit any more crimes or get any more trouble. Now, this is a lawful act on the part of uh, Judge Nethercutt. It, it, he has the authority to do that. Now, at the same time that these pleas of guilty to uh, these, uh, this 20-year felony, the judge, after sentencing under the Holmes Youthful Trainee Act, sends him to the county jail for 90 days. Then he released him under the state student release program where they can leave the county jail on school days at 8 in the morning and go to school and return at 8 p.m. each night, Monday through Friday. They stay overnight on weekends in the jail, and uh, or they stay overnight during the week in jail, and on the weekends, the both days, they stay in jail. While this procedure on its face may seem reasonable or unreasonable to some people, since these young people have no previous record they're entitled to be considered for this. Now the caveat that seems to have angered the law-abiding citizens seems to be this football being released from jail to play football. It seems the school itself expanded the sentence to bestow upon these newest additions to Rogue's Gallery the privilege of playing in a very important high school football game between Southwestern and Grand Blanc High School last Friday night. Now, here's Ron Fonger's story that broke it open. It was on last Saturday's paper. It says, From Cell to Field. And he tells the story very succinctly in that. And the television people finally caught up to him in uh, this past uh, Sunday and Monday. And uh, I want to show you both those stories, but they're kind of interesting uh, because they kind of approach it from a different angle.
Can you play uh, the first one for us, please? For Angie, they are stars on the football field, but two Flint Southwestern Academy students are also convicted felons. Tonight, questions are being raised as to why they were let out of jail to play in a game Friday night. ABC 12's Joel Fike joins us live from the Genesee County Jail with the story. Joel. Well, the two students pled guilty to felony home invasion and spent the weekend right here at the Genesee County Jail. Their plea also allows them to go to school and to play in the football game last Friday night. Among the players who led Southwestern Academy to victory over Grand Blank, 17-year-old Tyrone Ward, seen here, and 18-year-old Reginald Owens. We talked to Ward before the game. It's been all type of talk. Everybody, it's, it's the talk of the city right now. Grand Blank and Southwestern game. And but people are also talking about Ward's life off the field. He pled guilty along with teammate Reginald Owens to felony home invasion. Neighbors say the incident happened in July in this Ottawa Hills neighborhood in Grand Blank Township. No one was home when we stopped by. The county prosecutor says details of the arrest are sealed since they were sentenced under a state law that allows youthful first-time offenders to go to school while serving time at night and on weekends. These two pled guilty to the charge of the crime that I charged them with, and it's the crime they committed. I want that perfectly clear. There wasn't any plea bargain. The pair were sentenced by Genesee County Circuit Court Judge Jeffrey Nethercutt, who declined comment. The Jesse County Sheriff and the principal of Southwestern Academy aren't talking either. Ward is the son of former court administrator and judicial candidate Lynette Ward, who was unavailable to comment. The prosecutor dismisses any suggestion that the pair were given preferential treatment. Holmes Youthful Trainee Act status is given in many cases where the 17 through 20 year olds uh, qualify for it. We don't give it out based upon status in the community or who your mother is. We give it out if you're qualified. The decision to allow them to play rested with the Southwestern Academy head coach Gary Lee who didn't return a phone call. Jail records indicate the pair could finish their sentence as early as next month. Live in Flint, Joel Fike, ABC 12 News. Joel, thank you. Well, uh, Joel, that was a good report by Joel, and uh, now we want to show you Channel 66 and Channel 5 story, which is the same story. And it's interesting to see what happened to this young girl that went out to try to get some a different angle on the story, like what are the students thinking? And here's what she ran into. Can you play that, please? 17-year-old Tyrone Ward and 18-year-old Reginald Owen received the pass so they could play for Flint Southwestern Academy. According to the Flint Journal, the pair were arrested in July for breaking into a home in Grand Blanc Township. They were sentenced under a state law that allows youthful offenders to go to school under the day while the jail sentence at night and on weekends. Flint Southwestern Academy beat Grand Blanc last night 39-29. It was a beautiful late summer day across the right. TV no. Kim Russell has more. Well, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it here. It's private property. It's private property. That's where you go. As we approached students leaving Flint Southwestern Academy, school security officers demanded we leave. You're on public property, you are infringing our rights. I'm going to keep infringing your rights. You can have me arrested for a day. This even as we stayed just off school property. You're not going to do that still here. And while security guards said they were protecting the privacy of students trying to leave, we'd only approached off camera a student being driven home by a parent. She got the chance to say this before we had focused our cameras. So I don't think it's good. Well. Then we were interrupted. All this over two now infamous football players. 17-year-old Brandon Ward and 18-year-old Reginald Owens were on the field Friday on school and school activity release from jail. When not on the field or in class, they are locked up serving a 90-day sentence in the Genesee County Jail for breaking into a home in July. Kim Russell, WNEM, TV5 on Fox 67. Now... While both these stories are very enlightening and the newspaper article uh, has a lot of information in it, and again, it's Ron Fonger who's breaking these stories, they don't tell you the whole story, which we'll give you tonight, that might change some people's minds on whether these students should be pampered and let out of jail to not only 
have the opportunity to be a football hero, but even to continue to interact with, this, with the school students at Southwestern. You know, while Judge Nethercutt uh, has the legal right to take this action, and probably rightfully so, and this you and cry would not have been called, uh, would not have uh, been made if they weren't released to play in the football game. And that wasn't Ju Judge Nethercutt's doing. A further question under these circumstances to the school itself, the school administration, be doing this kind of thing. What, is, what message does it see, uh, send? You know, according to the information I've been able to gather, Judge uh, Nethercutt's order allowing uh, these two to go to school did not specifically say they could play football. This was a school's decision. Keep in mind the sheriff and the prosecutor were not really involved in decision, the decision making by Judge Nethercutt. That's his prerogative. They're just following the orders. The judge orders them to release at 8 in the morning and they must return at 8 at night. And that's what he's doing. The information we will show you tonight is the result of our own investigation when we began, began after reading Fonger's story. Now gathering this information was not an easy task because the police and the court files have been sealed and they're not available to the public. The information we'll share with you has been checked and double checked and we believe it to be true. The facts that when you look at this case, the reason we got interested in going beyond what was being reported was that the sentence of these two individuals was, or that they were charged with, the crime they were charged with, was a 20-year felony. Now this law is unique. It has various types of charges you can make depending on the seriousness of the crime. If this was as Limited, uh, the, the limited disclosure indicates a first offense burglary and no aggravating circumstances, these two guys would have uh, been charged with a misdemeanor like entering without permission or at the most a five-year burglary charge, not a 20-year felony. In either one of these cases, the five-year or the misdemeanor, they, they would have been put on probation with no jail time. So why the 20-year felony charged by the prosecutor? Bang, that turns a light on. Must be something to that. That's the most severe charge that can be made by the prosecutor. As I said, five-year, 15-year, 20-year. The severity of the charge depends on how aggravated the circumstances of the crime turned out to be. Now when you see the 20-year one that the prosecutor charges, which is the maximum charge you can make in a burglary, a home invasion case, and the judge giving 90 days in jail rather than the usual probation for a first offense uh, insignificant burglary in the sense that there was nobody occupying the house, there was no weapons used, and it's a first offense. Now, here's, here's what the 20 year requires, the 20 year charge with the prosecutor made against these two guys. It indicates, as I say, use of a gun or the house was occupied at the time of the burglary. These circumstances would have justified a 20 year charge. Now here's what happened. There was a break-in of a house, and at the time it was unoccupied. While they were in burglarizing the house and stuffing property in 
a garbage bag, the occupant of the house returns during this commission of the crime. Therefore, the 20-year felony comes into play as soon as the occupant walks into the, the, uh, in on the burglars. Now, there's some very interesting aspects of this case. Now, according to the occupant's statement, the burglars had a gun wrapped in a cloth and they were menacing the occupant. That's according to the statement. They had filled garbage uh, containers with, with property. Now, shortly after the occupant arrived, they ran out of the house. These two guys ran out of the house, the two felons, the two football players. And the occupant called the police and the burglars were apprehended a short time after. Now, when they were arrested, the burglars didn't have the gun, any kind of a weapon. You know, if the young man who came in the house and caught them burglarizing the house uh, it was correct, they, they may have discarded it. I'm sure if the gun was found, Prosecutor David Layton would have charged them with possession of a gun in the commission of a felony. That was a that'd be a mandatory two-year prison term, since the gun wasn't found, and they only had the occupants' uh, observations of a possible gun wrapped in a cloth. Um, it would have been difficult to prove uh, the existence of the gun. You know, the, here's the irony of this whole affair: is the occupant of the house is a student at Grand Blank High School and attended school at Grand Blank with one of these burglars, Tyrone Ward, before Ward switched to Southwestern. And this young man who came home and found his house being burglarized plays on the Grand Blank football team and played against Ward and this other fellow Friday night. After they had burglarized his house, that was in, in July, here he had to go out there and play against them in a football game when they should have been in jail. You know, I honestly believe that both these guys were well known to the occupant. They went to school together. And while they were classmates at Grand Blank, they visited this house and knew what valuables were in the house. And I think they staked it out and began the burglary when they thought the occupants, his parents, were not at home. I believe the occupant arrived before they completed the burglary was unexpectedly. You know, this, the choice of, of this home was not a coincidence. You get thousands of homes in Grand Blanc City and Township, and they pick the one house of the young man that they go to school with that was a friend of theirs. May have been on the football together at Grand Blanc, at least Ward may have been with him, although I understand Ward was ineligible out there, but they knew each other. They may have been in that house and knew what property was there. Why else would they have picked this house? Now, again, the onus for allowing these students, now convicted felon, felons, falls on the school who could have refused to allow them to play as pure discipline. You know, if the shame befalls Southwestern and its students after the school's leniency, it doesn't rest on the students. It rests on the Southwestern administration. And now it turns out the Flint Board of Education. Because here's, here's the latest story today, Tuesday. 
football players back in the game. Well, it turns out the inter the interim school superintendent suspended the kids yesterday, these two students, when she found out about what had happened. They were allowed to play after they, uh, they came from jail. Then she received some pressure from outside people who came to talk to her. And within two hours, she changed her mind again and said they won't be suspended. They'll investigate it first. What are you going to investigate? These young men were taken from the jail or left the jail and went and played in the football game for your school. What message does that send to young people? What message does it send to parents? I mean, this school now will be looked upon with ridicule, sarcasm. These kids, when they go out in the field, they'll have all kinds of names shouted at them because of these two people that are on that team. They've been left back. They were left back on the team by the superintendent. Now, that doesn't speak well of the superintendent. I think whether she acted, if she didn't act at all, she'd better, been better off than acting in two hours, changing with a little pressure put on her. And you know, not only the kids that are on the football team, because all the other kids on that football team are, I know a lot of them, they're very nice kids. I have one of those youngsters that lives next door to me and just an outstanding young man, honor roll. I've, I've known him since he was a little kid. I've watched him grow up and he's a class act. And because of him, I pull for Southwestern when they play a game because he plays on the team. And he's an outstanding athlete. And now he's branded by this terrible thing that has come out about these kids playing after they leave their jail cells in order to play. You know, also, when you consider all these facts, what guarantees does this administration, the school administration, offer these kids and parents of Southwestern that those two burglars who may have been using a gun who went into a house that's occupied and charged with a 20-year felony, the most serious felony of home invasion you can charge them with, they're sitting in school next to these kids. In close contact with them. You know, what, what kind of feeling must a parent have about these young people sitting next to their daughter or their son in school when they consider what they did to a so-called friend in Grand Blank. It's not a good thing. You know, here, here's another thing. Some people suggest that this might be kind of a prank type thing. Look, when you're, you're walking around with garbage bag full of property, as we've been advised, that's not a prank. Not a prank. You know, th this is a case, as another example that you get what you pay for. The Manley brothers represented these students and obviously gave them outstanding representation. They did what they're supposed to do, represent their clients to the full extent of the law. They're both honorable attorneys and they did nothing wrong. The judge did nothing wrong. The schools made a bad decision. The school board made a bad decision. The administrator at least 
the superintendent did. I don't know if the school board was involved in this. It would be hard for me to believe they were because they weren't called together to have a meeting to discuss it, which they'd have to do. They'd have to have a public meeting, and there was no public meeting, so she obviously took it upon herself to do this. They're the ones that caused the shame that has fallen on the school. Now, obviously, the Manleys came up with this plan to put these two young men on the Holmes Youthful Trainee Act, they gave them that status, and had the judge apply the standard or student release program to let the kids go finish their high school. I, obviously, they did their work, their research, and made a presentation. It wasn't off the seat of their pants. These guys are prepared. So they did the job for their clients, which every, every attorney is supposed to do. And, and as far as I know, most of them do. You know, maybe it'll work. Maybe there'll be no further criminal activity by these people. Maybe they finish school and go to college and do well thereafter. Hopefully that will be the final result. Of course, it'll take a lot longer for Southwestern to regain, regain their reputation as a school more concerned with ac academics than sports. How do they resurrect their reputation as a teaching institution? Now, having said that, and indicating to you that there was much more to this case than meets the eye, and because the, the records are sealed, you may not have known this information, but after many years at this work and other work, uh, you know where to go to find it, you, you know who to talk to, you know there are people out there that are aware of the facts, and probably as upset as, as you watching are about what happened here. Now there was an, another case that was kind of on the other at the extreme that was on tele, uh, was uh, uh, shown on television about a week ago that I thought should be shown to you here because of this case that might let you see the two extremes that we're talking about here. Can you play that next tape, please? Being unfairly penalized because he wanted to serve his country. Go! The three most important things in Stephen Brewer's life, his family, football, more than anything, I'm to play. And now the military. It was a pretty big decision. I was hesitant for a while. He made that commitment. He, he's dedicated, and he, he did it, and so, yeah, there's a lot of pride there. Go! Go! Steven's in the best shape of his life. Basic training will do that to a guy. We focus on Saturday, 1 o'clock on our field. But the senior will be stuck on the sidelines. The rules state that players must attend 15 practices before their first game. I wish he was on the field. I mean, I guess I won't lie about that, but... Um, but as a as a school district, you know, like I said, we're we're kind of tied tied with what we can do. The family knew the rules before Stephen even left, but his father came here to the school in June, hoping for an exception. He then went to Section Five, which is the regional governing body for high school sports. After that, he went right to State Senator Michael Mazzolio. Senator Mazzolio sent a letter this week to the Athletic Association. In it, he called the regulation an insult to the brave young men and women who have made a difficult choice to place their lives in jeopardy in defense of our nation's freedoms. He goes on to say, instead of penalizing Stephen Brewer, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association should be highlighting the incredible commitment and sacrifice he has made to our country. Ready? Break down! He says the team is behind Stephen too, anxious to get him on the field and help them win some games this season. Coming up. Well, 
as I say, that that looked like it was completely unreasonable to penalize that young man under those circumstances. But they had rules and they abided by the rules. And you have to commend them for that. Where's the rules for the Flint school system which deals with people who are in jail coming out and playing athletics against other kids and with other kids. They really should have a rule about that if, if this is going to happen again in the articles in the paper. Uh, th th unfortunately, this had national publicity mentioning Southwestern High School allowing this to happen. And it was like a, a joke. That's why this is so unfortunate because it not only brands the school but even the students that go there. And that's unfair. You know, I, I been watching Southwestern and I hope Southwestern goes undefeated because the actions of these two should not detract from all the other fine young men on that team. I know some of them and they are just great young men and I hope they win the rest of their games with or without those two guys. Well, anyway, here's another story that was in the press rather prominently over the last couple of weeks. It concerns an investigator or a, uh, uh, what they call a, a uh, it says here, and one of Williamson's, talking about Don Williamson, the mayor, it talks about mayor's aides accused, two of them, and it talks about this one. And one of Williamson's hand-picked members of the City Police Citizen Service Bureau was taken off duty after allegations he assaulted a woman. State police are investigating the allegations against the Citizen Bureau inspector, they call them inspectors, and are expected to forward the findings to the Genesee County Prosecutor's Office for review. Well, it had, they haven't got the uh, results yet, and uh, the prosecutor's office hasn't, so no decision has been made. But we have certain information that has not been made public that we'd like to share with you that I think uh, you should know as, as uh, citizens of the community, and you should know what happened here. Can you play uh, that uh, channel, I think it's 12 story on this? The Flint Police Union confirms that it has learned from Acting Police Chief Gary Hagler, one of the Flint Police Department's inspectors is under investigation. We're told the inspector is being investigated for sexually assaulting a woman. Now sources say this incident allegedly happened Sunday evening here at the Flint Police Mini Station on MLK Avenue near Flint Park on the city's north side. The Michigan State Police and its crime lab were quickly called in to investigate. They are handling the criminal portion of this investigation. Tennessee County Prosecutor David Layton will only say his office and Michigan State Police are investigating the allegation. Flint Police are also conducting an internal investigation. Since the man hasn't been charged, we are not using his name, the name of the inspector, but we know he is part of the Department's Citizen Service Bureau, handpicked by the Flint mayor and heavily scrutinized since the members from the Citizen Ser Service Bureau were appointed. The mayor calls this a sad day. I picked the no work ethic, so you know, I'm just put one particular person you're talking about. You know, work with the FBI, the state police, and for many, many years in the corruption detail. So uh, I thought he was beyond approach, and he still might be. He's not been convicted of nothing. But it's just a horrible person to, to uh, a horrible situation where somebody would accuse somebody of this. 
Now, the man hasn't been arrested. Flint Police Chief Gary Hagler says the inspector accused of this criminal sexual conduct has currently been relieved of his duties, though, and that means he isn't being paid, but he's also been stripped of his gun, badge, and law enforcement authority. Now, it's unclear when this investigation will be wrapped up or if charges will be filed. We will keep you updated. Live in the newsroom, Tara Nash for ABC 12 News. Facts on this case. Incidentally, uh, the mayor was a little off on that in the sense that he was describing this people being trained or involved with the FBI. Uh, that's not correct. And I, I think uh, one of the other inspectors is the person that's uh, had that training, and I think that that uh, may have uh, caused the you know, to make that kind of a mistake. I don't think it was intentional. I just think that he misunderstood uh, when they were telling him who the fellow was. But, but here, here are the facts on this case that I think that you should be told about. About 10 days ago, the Flint police, this Flint police inspector was suspended without pay after a woman, he stopped for an alleged traffic violation, made a complaint against him, for sexual assault. You know, at that time, very few facts, as I said, were known because the Flint police and state police refused to make any of the alleged facts public. As a result, like the Southwestern football players, we were left to our own means of gathering the information. So we've, we went out and did that, and we're going to provide them to you tonight. At this time, the information we have is that the inspector involved stopped this woman who was driving with a female companion. Now, after speaking to the woman, She agreed to go to the North End Precinct building, uh, which actually, as I'm, I'm sure you people in North End know, is closed, but the inspector had a key to it. I guess they have meetings there from time to time, and these inspectors attend those meetings. Now, according to the information we have, the trip to the precinct was originally prompted to discuss the ticket the inspector was considering issuing for the woman's alleged traffic violation. While the female passenger waited in the car, the woman accompanied the inspector into the closed precinct station. After a short time, according to the female passenger, the complainant came out of the precinct by herself in a disheveled and highly overwrought condition. She asked the passenger to drive her to Hurley Hospital. When she arrived, we're told, the hospital attendants had to administer a sedative to her to calm her down. And according to our sources, the woman was so upset about what happened the Hurley emergency per, uh, uh, aid called the state police. It, now, having said that, there are these other facts that seem to be coming forward. It seems that the inspector may very well have known the woman, and as a result, the issue of consent to the sexual event will come into play, obviously. Now, some of the investigators, uh, or the investigation is revolving around the possibility the inspector may have even been stalking the woman when he pulled her over. Some of the investors think it's more than a coincidence that the inspector just came upon this woman and invited her into the precinct to discuss the ticket. Now, also, if it can be proven that the woman 
was coerced into pr uh, providing the inspector sex in lieu of him issuing a ticket, this would be an extortion, a very serious crime, with a possible 10-year jail sentence. Now, obviously, the woman passenger may be the key witness in this matter. It would seem if the sex was consensual, it's hard to visualize how her appearance and condition coming from the precinct would suggest consent. Well, incidentally, she didn't get a ticket. Now, we have another case that I think, another story that I think is important. It has to do with a proposal in the legislature that would permit teachers to carry guns in school. Now, any reasonable person, I think, would recognize that's not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. Somebody, other than a police officer, being allowed to carry guns in the school, carry them in their purse, carry them a, uh, as a shoulder harness, with a shoulder harness. How, that's crazy. Kids seeing this, kids knowing maybe where a gun is stored in a purse, going in and taking it out. That's just looking for trouble. But this guy thinks, uh, this legislator from Western Michigan thinks it might be a good idea. Let's see what the teachers and the public think about this. Can you play that tape, please? Hi, Taryn. Representative Ajima says he firmly believes that this legislation will help keep kids safe, that this legislation will save lives, and he says it'll do it by helping decrease the incidence of violent crimes on school grounds. Representative David Ajima believes there's one thing that deters public acts of violence. People who engage in mass public shootings are significantly deterred by the possibility of a law-abiding citizen might be carrying a gun. The Republican has drafted House Bill number 5162. If adopted, it would give school districts the option of having armed personnel on school grounds. The increase in deadly school shootings across the country prompted the legislation. I wanted to have basically a disaster preparedness plan for the schools, that something in place so that in case something unthinkable occurs, you have the mechanism in place already in law. But is bringing guns into the school the answer? Many in mid-Michigan say no. You never know a uh, student come up and grab a teacher and get a gun and start shooting at um, the kids. So for their safety, I don't think teachers should have guns in the classroom. What if the teacher loses their temper? And then they shoot one of the kids, and then it's a lawsuit, and it's just a big mess, and we have dead kids. That's just a bad idea. I don't think that's right, because you never know what the teacher mind is, either. So I'm looking for safety for the kids, and if these people got a better idea how to do it, I wish they'd put it on the table. I just think better um, parent and school relationships, you know, both of them working harder towards um, making sure that the kids behave and do what they need to do. A spokesperson from the Michigan Education Association, which is the state's largest teachers' union, they say they are firmly against this legislation. In the newsroom, Don Jones, ABC. And, and I might mention to you the same person that they were talking about from the MEA, Michigan Educational Association, uh, indicated that uh, their surveys show that almost 100% of the teachers don't want this at all. They know it's just opening up Pandora's box where people, they'll have running gun battles in the school. Much more serious instances than we've seen so far if you allow 50, 100 other people walk into a school with guns. That's a stupid, stupid thing to do. And Hopefully our legislature, uh, legislators will have better sense to vote for anything like that. And if you see them on the street or you want to write them, tell them they better not vote for it.
because you'll remember it in the next election. Incidentally, last week we talked about the vice president of the Flint School Board, Raymond Hatter, being arrested for no operator's license and having his, a, a, uh, his license suspended five, six, seven times for, not, for driving without an, uh, an operator's license. And we said, you know, how can the guy justify this kind of ac action and be a vice president on the school board and be a role model for children. All those people on the school board as members or officers are role models. And if the people that are in charge of the schools don't obey the law and don't do the right thing, then how can you expect the kids to do it? You have this thing with Southwestern High School. Is that an example of the lax uh, lackadaisical attitude of the uh, school system in this community? The school board, the school administrators? It doesn't bode well for them. But anyway, we said last week that Mr. Hatter, the first thing he ought to do is clean up his tickets, get on the, the right... Uh, line again and do the right thing, get straightened around on this license, and apologize to the public. If he did those things, it would seem to me, he could stay on the board. But anyway, this past week, the next day after I said those things, and I'm not, I don't know if I had any influence on him, there was an article in the paper that had her apologizes for traffic arrests. He also says that uh, uh, he says uh, our inattention and procrastination were completely inexcusable. I don't know who R is. I would think he really means my inattention. He said Hatter said he is uh, complying with all mandates to resolve past and pending civil violations. Well, if he's done that and does it, then, yeah, he, why not stay on the board? He probably deserves to stay on the board. But somebody should be making sure he does what he says he's going to do and correct those problems and get those tickets straightened out so that he uh, can be on the right road to get his license back to drive a car. And he, you know, he better not be driving to... Uh, his meetings or any place, his job or whatever, he better have somebody driving him or taking a cab because uh, that, somebody's going to find that out. And if that's happening, uh, he'll really be in the hole then. You know, there's a interesting story that came up uh, last, oh, about two weeks ago, and the Journal wrote an editorial on it, and it has to do with a bill that uh, State Senator Gleason, who is, is totally an opportunist, political opportunist, uh, he wants to guarantee that the legislature develop an economic development plan that will only fund and award tax breaks incentives to companies that hire 100% Michigan workers. Now, you know, I'm all for trying to get jobs for Michigan people. But here we are, a big company now is looking at this and saying, we got, uh, we're going to have 3,000 people or 4,000 people to put to work in Michigan if we locate there. We have all kinds of people on our staff you know, they may be engineers, they may be uh, chemists, uh, scientists. And they've been with the company for some period of time. If this law passes, what do you think the chances are of them coming to, the, uh, to Michigan to locate when they have to lay off their almost entire staff to hire only local people which may not have the expertise that's needed for their company. They're not coming. This is a 
This Gleason, that's a ridiculous law. It seems to me, and here's what the journal says is just what I said. But as a trade-off for protecting themselves, the lawmakers place extra burdens on companies that would provide work in the state. In the long run, it might even cost Michigan residents more jobs. And it, it just seems rather ridiculous that they would come up with such a proposal as this. Now, I mentioned to you last week that I want to discuss this Big Ten network, BTN, that's in a big squabble with Comcast about Comcast putting the Big Ten network on cable, on basic cable. They want to be on basic cable so that the people who want to watch the games the Big Ten games won't have to pay extra for it. But what the Big Ten doesn't tell you is that the they want to charge Comcast like a dollar and a half for every one of their customers, whether they watch the game or not. They have something like four hundred and fifty thousand, five hundred thousand. Comcast customers in Michigan or in the area where they will broadcast the game. Keep in mind, this is what they call second tier games that would be shown. The first tier games, the Ohio State, the Michigans, the Penn States, the Wisconsin's, the, you know, the Purdue's, the top teams will be on regular television like CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC. Their games will be shown there. So what you're really paying for is to see other teams play that would not be top, what they consider top tier, like uh, Illinois, uh, Indiana, at this time Michigan State and them all. Although many of Michigan State games, because of their large school population, will be on those top tiers. But if you want to seem like last week's game uh, against uh, whomever they played. I forget who they played. Oh, uh, that, was, that was not on regular television. In order to see it, you had to have the Big Ten Network. So to get it now without Comcast, you have to, it's, it's broadcast by Fox Cable, and the only way to get that, apparently, is through the dish. So here we have uh, confronting uh, commercials. First you have Comcast saying, hey, if they want to come on Comcast, we have no objection to it, but they have to come on to our special sports channel, and they would have to pay for that extra. And the uh, Big Ten Network says, we want to be on basic cable, so our people don't have to pay extra to watch these games. But what Big Ten Network wants is that to get on basic cable, to give them basic cable, Big Ten Network, they want to be paid by Comcast like a dollar and a half for every one of those customers. Now, keep in mind, the only people watching those games, that second tier games, would be a very small percentage of people because the football fans won't be all won't be watching those games necessarily. They'll be watching the Michigan, the Ohio State, the Wisconsin, the Penn State, the Purdue games, even the Iowa games, which will be on national television on the regular networks like CNN, CNN two, as I say. Uh, FS, FSN and, and all those other networks. And because the Big Ten Network has been organized, they now control those games. It used, the games used to be controlled by the network and the schools. Last week I noticed on FSN is the game that where they televised the baseball, the Tigers games, 
had three football games. They had Fresno State playing somebody. They had Colorado State playing somebody. They had someone else out west playing, Wyoming playing some. It was ridiculous. Our games, the Michigan State game, could have been put on that network, but because the Big Ten network controls the distribution of the games now and not the university itself, it couldn't be shown. You had to buy their cable system, the, the dish, in order to get the game. Now I think that's a little unfair. You know, like with regard to Comcast and regard to the Big Ten Network, you know, it's like six of one, half a dozen the other. They're both jockeying for position. There's conflicting editor, er, um, commercials by each one blaming the other one. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. And all the time this is going on, we can't see the games. So it seems to me, either they put it on basic cable and the Big Ten Network not charge Comcast to watch the games or to be on their cable, or the Comcast agree not to charge them to put them on that special sports net network they have that they now charge everybody else to get on. You know, it's kind of an impasse. I don't know what the answer is other than the fact that, you know, these two prima donnas, the Big Ten Network and Comcast, end up playing their stupid game and it, uh, the result is that it it really screws the public. They don't get to watch the games they want to watch. Well, anyway, um, we've given you some idea of what's happening in that southwestern program or that southwestern uh, fiasco, and also the issue of the inspector in the Flint Police Department and uh, what's happening with that. And uh, we hope to have even more information on those two subjects next week and uh, some other stories that we're working on. So if uh, you like what we're doing, come on back and watch us. We'll be back here next week at 8 o'clock, or you can watch us at 11 to 12 on Wednesday, or you can tune in to FlintTalk.com and watch it anytime you want, and you can go back 8, 10 weeks, watch all those programs. And uh, so we'll be with you next week, God willing. In the meantime, we'll be at the White Horse.